Hey everybody, this is a section from The Social and Political Thought of Leon Trotsky by Burak Knai Paz. The section that I'm going to be reading from... Sorry, one second. Is from uh, part three of the book. From the section, uh, Socialism in One Country, The End of World Revolution. And the particular section I'm going to be reading is The Fate of World Revolution, Germany and China. One second. All right, here we are. The Fate of World Revolution From the time of his exile in 1929 until his death in 1940, Trotsky wrote voluminously about events and developments in Europe. Almost daily, Trotsky produced articles and pamphlets, not, in mention, not to mention an inexhaustible stream of letters on Germany, France, Britain, Spain, and Italy, as well as the United States. Footnote Trotsky's vast correspondence of this period is preserved in his archives at Harvard. Some of it, however, is in the closed section. And footnote. At the same time, Trotsky took a particular interest in events in China, and on this subject alone, his writings could fill two or three substantial volumes. To attempt to deal with the full scope of this material is to become embroiled in the detailed history of the decade or so which it covers. We cannot even begin to do so here, not only for reasons of space, but also because these writings are, on the whole, of purely historical interest today and only peripherally valuable as sources for Trotsky's social and political thought. However, in the case of writings on two of the countries mentioned above, Germany and China, a brief summary of them will throw additional light on the theoretical issues dealt with in the course of this study. This is so because Trotsky was convinced that the success of the Nazi movement in Germany and the blow to the communist movement in the late 1920s in China were in large part the result of Soviet and Comintern policy towards these movements, a, a policy dictated by the demands of the doctrine of, quote, socialism in one country, end quote. Therefore, analysis of developments in these countries was, for Trotsky, a kind of empirical aspect of the theoretical controversy with Stalin and, in turn, a part of the older debate on the significance and implications of a Russian revolution. Two footnotes here. First footnote. For a brief survey... Of his commentaries on the international situation, see Giuliano Procacci, Trotsky's view of the critical years of 1929 to 36 in Science of Soci and Society, published in 1963. On France, Trotsky's main writings are collected in the following Où va la France, published as volume 2 of Trotsky Écrit, uh, Écrit 19. 28 to 1940. For the English version of this, with however some variations in the content, see Trotsky with her France. Trotsky, Les Mouvements Communistes en France, 1967, published in 1967. On Britain, see in particular his. Sorry, this is a fucking Russian, I can't read that. Which contains 
extracts from English reactions to Trotsky's 1925 book and Trotsky's answer to these reactions. See also the compilation Leon Trotsky on Britain published by the Monad Press, New York, 1973. For his main writings on Spain, see the excellent compilation issued by Pathfinder Press, Trotsky, The Spanish Revolution, 1931-39. to Some of the items on Spain can also be found in French in Trotsky de la Révolution, 1968, in Volume 3 of the Crete, 1928-1940. to Trotsky's writings on Italy are much more sparse, but still too numerous to list individually. See, as an example, his letter to Italian communists, published in the Opposition Bulletin, May 1930. And for Trotsky's writings on the United States, see Europe and America. And the items listed as, at, excuse me, and the item was listed at Note 175, Chapter 11 below. The Russian versions of the writings on France and Spain mentioned above are to be found chiefly in the archives and in the Opposition Bulletin. Two. The second, or second footnote, the failure of communist movements in general, and in France in particular, were also largely attributed by Trotsky to Soviet and Comintern policies, but the case of Germany and China were for him especially conspicuous. Okay, end footnote. Aside from this, however, in the case of Germany, his analysis of the nature of Nazism is in itself an, of intrinsic value. And in the case of China, it is instructive to see how his Russian as well as Western preconceptions misled him and undermine his grasp of revolutionary realities in the East. In what follows, therefore, we shall attempt to bring out these aspects of his thought. Section A. Germany Footnote The Only Road, published in New York, 1933, references are to the reprint of this edition in Trotsky, The Struggle Against Fascism in Germany, published in New York in 1971. The Russian original of The Only Road has not been traced. References to other some other of Trotsky's writings on Germany are given in the footnotes. The writings here mentioned, as well as many others, are included in English and French compilations of Trotsky's writings on Germany. For the English, see the above mentioned The Struggle Against Fascism in France. For the French, see Trotsky, Écrit, 1928-1940. And footnote. For Trotsky, the passage of time did not diminish the importance of Germany for the future of the world revolution. On the contrary, at the 19, as the 1930s opened, Trotsky was more convinced than ever that everything hinged on the course of events in Germany. Quote, Socialist construction in the USSR, the course of the Spanish Revolution, the development of the pre-revolutionary situation in England, the future of French imperialism, the fate of the revolutionary movement in China and India, all this directly and immediately rests upon the question of who will be victorious in Germany, dot dot dot, communism or fascism, end quote, Trotsky. Footnote. Uh, some... Russian citation. No footnote. <laughs> in 1931, however, when this was written, the German Communist Party had long ceased to be an independent entity. Like most other communist parties, the Communist Party of Germany's leadership consisted of men obedient above all to Moscow and subject to policies chosen and dictated from thence. Footnote. For an account by one of the leaders of German communism, of the manner in which Stalin came to dominate the KPD, see Root Fischer, Stalin and German Communism, published in Cambridge in 19, Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1948. Um, Root Fischer was a member of the KPD um, who uh, I think later became a, uh, an anti-communist in the United States. Um, and footnote. These policies were, as a result, determined in accordance with immediate Soviet considerations and had become, in fact, 
an extension of Soviet foreign policy in general. In June 1928, when the Sixth Congress of the Comintern met, one second. It was decided that a new period, the quote, third, end quote, now opened in Europe, one characterized by a renewed, quote, decay, of, end quote, of capitalism and a consequent intensification of the class struggle. One second. But this was interrupted, excuse me, footnote. The revolutionary period up to 1923 was referred to as the first period, and the non-revolutionary one from 1924 as the, quote, second period. End footnote. But this was interrupted as, excuse me, interpreted as meaning above all a struggle against the social democratic parties, which are now declared to be no less dangerous than fascism. A new term was launched, quote, social fascism, end quote, and identified with social democracy, the defeat of which was now seen as the first priority. In the subsequent years, communist parties in Europe, and especially in Germany, devoted all their efforts to this task, which, while concurrently putting off a confrontation with fascism itself. Um, I'm going to read some introdu Wikipedia introductions. Um, the first is for the third period. The third period is an ideological concept adopted by the Communist International at its Sixth World Congress held in Moscow in summer of 1928. The third period set policy until reversed when the Nazis took over Germany in 1933. The Comintern's theory was based on its economic and political analysis of world capitalism, which posited the division of recent history into three periods. These included a, quote, first period that followed World War I and saw the revolutionary upsurge and defeat of the working class, as well as a, quote, second period of capitalist consolidation for most of the decade of the 1920s. According to the Comintern's analysis, the current phase of world economy from 1928 onward, the so-called, quote, third period, end quote, was to be a time of widespread economic collapse and mass working class radicalization. This economic and political discord would again make the time ripe for proletarian revolution if militant policies were rigidly maintained by communist vanguard parties, the Comintern believed. Communist policies during the third period were marked by pronounced hostility to political reformism and, politi and political organizations, espousing it as an impediment to the movement's revolutionary objectives. In the field of trade unions, a move was made during the third period towards the establishment of radical dual unions under Communist Party control, rather than continuation of the previous policy of attempting to radicalize existing unions by, quote, boring from within, end quote. The rise of the Nazi Party to power in Germany in 1933 and the annihilation of the organized communist movement there shocked the common turn into reassessing the tactics of the third period. From 1934, new alliances began to be formed under the aegis of the so-called, quote, popular front, end quote. The popular front policy was formalized at the official po as the official policy of the world communist movement by the Seventh World Congress of the common turn in 1935. The next is I want to read the introduction for the Sixth World Congress of the Communist International. The Sixth, World, the Sixth Congress of the Communist International was held in Moscow from July 17th to September 1st, 1928. The Congress was attended by 515 delegates from 65 organizations, including 50 communist parties from 57 countries. Adopting the theory of the, quote, third period, end quote, Congress proclaimed social democracy to be, quote, social fascism, end quote. Okay, back to the text. The consequences of this policy are too well known to need restating that it split and demoralized the left while simultaneously leaving the right largely unchallenged is obvious. To what extent, however, can it be said that were it not for this policy, the right, that is, fascism, could have been stopped? This is a question which raises again the relationship of, quote, subjective, end quote, to, quote, objective, end quote, factors the importance of instrumental means, tactics, organization, and so on, 
as against social and historical realities, classes, economic conditions, cultural phenomena. We have already seen that since 1917, Trotsky had been convinced that all the objective factors were right for revolution in Europe, and that its actual manifestation depended mainly, if not only, upon the proper choice of instrumental measures. In the case of Germany during the crucial years preceding 1933, Trotsky continued to argue this same case. It would not be an exaggeration, in fact, to say that not only did Trotsky believe that fascism could have been stopped and a communist revolution carried out, but that the success of fascism was directly attributable to, er to, <laughs> attributable to errors of the communist movement in Germany, or rather, of the Soviet regime which controlled it. From the outset, Trotsky considered fascism the main threat to the working class movement and, as we shall presently see, because of its social roots, a real immediate, not a passing danger. Trotsky had, of course, little if any admiration for the Social Democrats. The Social Democrats were, in his view, a conservative, non-revolutionary force, pacifying the German workers, and interested mainly in maintaining the democratic parliamentary structure as the framework for their socialism. But to consider the Social Democrats fascist, were no better than fascists, seemed to Trotsky conceptually and historically absurd and politically disastrous. There was no question but that the social democracy was fundamentally an enemy of the communist movement, nor that eventually the communist party would have to undermine the hold of social democracy over German workers. But in view of the growing success of fascism, the confrontation between communism and social democracy had to be grasped in its proper tactical context. Strategically, it was obviously true that before communism could succeed, social democracy had to be defeated. But this general proposition, in Trotsky's view, did not answer all possible immediate tactical questions. If, as was true in Germany, the main immediate threat to communism came from elsewhere and, as was also the case, this immediate threat could not be beaten down without, temporarily at least, joining forces with some, similarly threatened, of one's enemies. Then it was tactically not only legitimate but essential to forge such, alliance, such an alliance. Footnote. Something in Russian. No footnote. The point of this was that to continue concentrating on a long-term threat while being endangered by an immediate threat was to fall into one abyss before even reaching subsequent ones. Fascism threatened destroying communism before communism could fight social democracy. Again, this is not a matter of one abyss being better or worse than another, but of the choice of tactics and timing. Trotsky phrased the, mat the matter in the form of the following analogies, quote, there are seven keys in the musical scale. The question as to which of these keys is, quote, better, end quote, do, re, or sol, is a nonsensical question. But the musician must know when to strike and what keys to strike. The abstract question of who is the lesser evil, social democracy or fascism, is just as nonsensical, dot, dot, dot. Let us cite another example. When one of my enemies sets before me small daily portions of poison and the second, on the other hand, is about to shoot me straight at me, then I will first knock the revolver out of the hand of my second enemy, for this gives me an opportunity to get rid of my first enemy. But this does not at all mean that the poison is a, quote, lesser evil, end quote, in comparison with the revolver, end quote. Footnote. It says here in a piece, in a piece called Nemetz. Gaia Revolutia. Trotsky recounted the following, quote, fable, end quote, by way of illustrating the same point. Quote, a cattle dealer once drove some bulls to the slaughterhouse. The butcher came nigh with his sharp knife. Quote, let us close ranks and jack up this executioner on our horns, end quote, suggested one of the bulls. Quote, if you please, in what way is the butcher any worse than the dealer who drove us hither with his cudgel, end quote, reply the bulls. Quote, but we shall be able to attend to the dealer as well afterwards, end quote. Quote, nothing doing, end quote, replied the bulls, firm in their principles to the counselor. Quote, 
You are trying to shield our enemies from the left. You are a social butcher yourself, end quote. And they refused to close ranks, end quote. Trotsky, end footnote. Given the distribution of forces in Germany, it was impossible to defeat social democracy and fascism at one and the same time. Moreover, fascism was pointing the revolver at the former as well. There was a natural if negative basis for an alliance here as there had been, for instance, in Russia in 1917 between Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, and others against Kornilov. Without harboring illusions about the future and without abandoning ultimate strategic goals, a tactical, quote, united front, end quote, was necessary between the communists and the social democrats. Neither partner would or could give in on the differences separating the one from the other, but insofar as there was a common enemy and therefore a common interest, collaboration was possible. This did not mean that as a result the communist struggle against social democracy would have to be entirely suspended. On the contrary, in a sense, such an alliance would serve this struggle since it would allow the communist access to the working masses, and an opportunity, therefore, to offset the conservative influence of social democracy. Between 1930 and 1933, Trotsky was thus amongst the most vociferous opponents of the concept of, quote, social fascism, end quote, and instead a proponent of the, quote, united front, end quote. Trotsky was convinced that a vi the victory of fascism would be not only a catastrophe for communism in Germany, but for the Soviet Union itself. It would, he predicted in 1931, quote, signify an inevitable war against the USSR, end quote. Um, I don't know if I said that, but no footnote. Um, when in the end that victory came, he did not hesitate to attribute it to the, quote, stupidities, end quote, of Stalinist leadership, which, in Trotsky's view, were a direct consequence of the doctrine of, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, proclaimed in the mid-1920s. This doctrine, he claimed, had obliged the Soviet Union to pursue internecine warfare abroad rather than revolutionary objectives. In Germany, far from stopping fascism, far from uniting the working class, the doctrine had been had made the workers more vulnerable than they already had been. By denouncing social democracy as a branch of fascism, it so alienated it as to reinforce its reformist capitulative tendencies so that in the end its weakness in the face of fascism itself was accentuated. And by imposing sectarian interest upon the German Communist Party, it turned it into a servant not of revolution, but of the private political machinations of the Stalinist regime. Thus, while supposedly staving off the, quote, poison, end quote, it was shot by the, quote, revolver, end quote. In retrospect, it is impossible to deny that there was a great deal of truth in Trotsky's contention that Stalinist policy only served to make things easier for fascism in Germany. But the conclusion Trotsky drew from this, that had a different policy been followed, Nazism could have been stopped, certainly emerges as a simplification. Perhaps it should be attributed to the fact that Trotsky had come to be so repelled by the Stalin regime as to see it in the source of seeing it the source of all evil, both in the Soviet Union and in the world at large. Whatever the case, Trotsky's own subsequent analysis of the nature of fascism, and of German Nazism in particular, shows that Trotsky was at least alive to the more profound social and historical roots of the fascist phenomenon. The, quote, theory of fascism, end quote, which Trotsky formulated was also in part a simplification since it made too much of the standard Marxist economic explanation, but it at least had the advantage of putting the phenomenon into social and historical perspective. Already in 1932, Trotsky had defined fascism as a political system to which the bourgeoisie resorts during the period of the, quote, decline of capitalism, end quote. That's from The Only Road, uh, 
in the struggle against fascism in Germany. The notion that the bourgeoisie was tied to a parliamentary democratic form of government was true in his view only of a particular stage of capitalism's development, excuse me, the bourgeoisie's development. The stage at which capitalism, having emerged from capitalism's Jacobinist revolutionary struggle for dominance, settled into a period, excuse me, settles into a period of unchallenged growth and maturity. During such a period, orderly democratic and reformist government parallels and facilities peaceful competition, the latter, excuse me, and par parallels and facilitates peaceful competition, the latter being the source of capitalism's growth. It is otherwise once the system begins to disintegrate. The commitment to democracy then emerges to be an axiomatic, excuse me, to be not axiomatic and eternal, but pragmatic and ephemeral. Since it is the economic system itself which is now at stake, all political measures needed to save it, including dictatorship, become legitimate. But the particular form of dictatorship which the crisis of capital encourages is not simply a political artifice hastily assembled to mete out force whenever necessary. It is that too, but it is first of all a reflection of the kind of social alliance which must be forged in order to deter the objective forces making for disintegration. These forces grow out of the conditions of mutual alienation and animosity, themselves a product of the decline of capitalism which separate the three main classes, the big bourgeoisie, now mainly finance capital, the petty bourgeoisie, and the proletariat, looked at in the context of the relationship among these classes during a period of the threat of economic collapse, fascism emerges as that political system which the big bourgeoisie finally must accept in order to effect an alliance with the petty bourgeoisie against the proletariat. In order to give a more detailed explication of this Trotsky social analysis of fascism, we need turn to various articles which he wrote following the triumph of Nazism in 1933. Footnote. What follows is based on the following articles. Uh, something in Russian... How long can Hitler stay? Um, yeah, it's all in Russian. End footnote. Um, okay. Here Trotsky began with the observation that although Germany was once a comparatively backward capitalist country, Germany had in the decades prior to 1914 managed to build an industrial edifice which catapulted Germany into the forefront of the capitalist world. As in all backward countries which undergo rapid change, pockets of the agrarian feudal past remained, retaining a partial hold over social and political power, and, in general, social anomalies were aggravated. But for all intents and purposes, Germany had become an integral part of the capitalist orbit and thus subject to the, quote, ills, end quote, affecting this orbit as a whole. Quote, overripeness, end quote, of the productive facilities leading to the, quote, imperialist, end quote, chase after markets and colonies and eventually to war and the growth in the potential power of the proletariat. In a period of economic expansion, the big bourgeoisie was able to prevent the workers' power from becoming actual by applying placated measures. Parliamentary enfranchisement, freedom of organization, economic rewards, and so on. However, in a period of economic decline, the big bourgeoisie was more and more forced into a direct confrontation with the workers. At first, in the years following the World War, this took the form of suppression by force. Thus, the growth of a Bonapartist regime, drawing its main office holders from the army, Hindenburg and von Papen, etc., using the police and military as its main props. Sorry. Sorry. 
And this, however, could only be a temporary measure in an industrially advanced nation such as Germany. Force could not in the end overcome the constant social pressures. What was needed was a more fundamental solution, one which took account of the reality and distribution of social classes and power. Um, I want to read uh, briefly these uh, introduction to uh, Franz von Papen. Franz Joseph Hermann Michael Maria von Papen lived from 1879 to 1969 and was a German conservative politician, reactionary, diplomat, Prussian nobleman, and general staff officer. Franz, I mean, uh, Franz von Papen served as the Chancellor of Germany in 1932 and then as the Vice Chancellor under Adolf Hitler from 1933 to 1934. Born into a family of Westphalian Catholic aristocrats, Papen served in the Prussian army from 19, 1898 onward and was trained as a German general staff officer. Von Papen served as military attaché in Mexico and the United States from 1913 to 1915, 15, while also covertly organizing acts of sabotage in the United States and quietly backing and financing Mexican forces in the Mexican Revolution on behalf of German military intelligence. After being expelled as persona non grata by the United States State Department in 1915, von Papen started, me, served as a battalion commander on the Western Front of World War I and finished his war service in the Middle Eastern Theater as a lieutenant colonel. Asked to become Chancellor of the Weimar Republic by President Paul von Hindenburg in 1932, Papen ruled by presidential decree. Franz von Papen launched the Preussenschlag coup against the Social Democratic Party-led government in the Free State of Prussia. Von Papen's failure to secure a base of support in the Reichstag led to his removal by Hindenburg and replacement by General Kurt von Schleicher. Determined to return to power, Papen, believing that Adolf Hitler could be controlled once he was in the government, pressured Hindenburg to appoint Hitler as Chancellor and Papen as Vice-Chancellor in 1933 in a cabinet ostensibly not under Nazi Party domination. Seeing military dictatorship as the only alternative to a Nazi Party Chancellor, Hindenburg consented. Papen and his allies were quickly marginalized by Hitler and he left the government after the Night of the Long Knives in 1934, during which the Nazis killed some of his allies and confidants. Subsequently, von Papen served the foreign, German Foreign Office as the ambassador in Vienna from 1934 to 1938 and in Ankara from 1939 to 1940. Von Papen joined the Nazi Party in 1938. After the Second World War, Papen was indicted for Nazi war crimes in the Nuremberg trials before the International Military Tribunal, but was acquitted of all charges. In 1947, a West German denazification court found Papen to have acted as the main culprit in crimes relating to the Nazi government. Papen was given a sentence of eight years imprisonment at hard labor, but was released on appeal in 1949. Franz von Papen's memoirs were published in 1952 and 1953. He died in 1969. Paul von Hindenburg lived from 1847 to 1934 and was a German field marshal and a statesman who led the Imperial German Army during World War I. He later became president of Germany from 1925 until his death. During his presidency, he played a key role in the Nazi seizure of power in January 1933 when, under pressure from his advisors, he appointed Adolf Hitler as Chancellor of Germany. Hindenburg was born in a family of minor Prussian nobility in Posen. Upon completing his education as a cadet, he enlisted in the 3rd Regiment of Foot Guards as a second lieutenant. He saw combat during the Austro-Prussian and Franco-Prussian Wars. In 1873, he was admitted to the prestigious Kriegsakademie in Berlin, where he studied for three years before appointed to the Army General Staff Corps. In 1885, Hindenburg was promoted to the rank of major and became a member of the General Staff. After a five-year teaching stint at the 
Krieg's Academy, Hindenburg steadily rose through the Army's ranks to become a lieutenant general by 1900. Around the time of Hindenburg's promotion to general of the infantry in 1905, Count Alfred von Schleffen recommended that he succeed him as chief of the great general staff, but the post ultimately went to Helmut von Moltke in January 1906. In 1911, Hindenburg announced his retirement from the military. After World War I started in July 1914, Hindenburg was recalled to military service and quickly achieved fame on the Eastern Front as the victor of Tannenberg. Subsequently, Hindenburg oversaw a crushing series of victories against the Russians that made Hindenburg a national hero and the center of a massive personality cult. By 1916, Hindenburg's popularity had risen to the point that he replaced General Erich von Falkenhayn as chief of the great general staff. Thereafter, Hindenburg and his deputy, General Erich Ludendorff, exploited Emperor Wilhelm II's broad delegation of power to the German Supreme Army Command to establish a de facto military dictatorship. Under their leadership, Germany secured Russia's defeat in the east and achieved advances on the western front deeper than any seen since the conflict's outbreak. However, by the end of 1918, all improvement in Germany's fortunes were reversed after the German army was decisively defeated in the Second Battle of the Maine and the Allies' Hundred Days Offensive. Upon Hindenburg's country's armistice with the Allies in November 1918, Hindenburg stepped down as Germany's commander-in-chief and retired once again from military service in 1918. In 1925, Hindenburg returned to public life to become the second elected president of the German Weimar Republic. Personally opposed to Adolf Hitler and Adolf Hitler's Nazi party, Hindenburg nonetheless played a major role in the political instability that resulted in their rise to power. After twice dissolving the Reichstag in 1932, Hindenburg agreed in January 1933 to appoint Adolf Hitler as chancellor in coalition with the Deutsche Nationale, Volkspartei. In response to the Reichstag fire, which was allegedly committed by Marinus van der Lubbe, he approved the Reichstag fire decree in February 1933, which suspended various civil liberties. Later in March, Hindenburg signed the Enabling Act of 1933, which gave the Nazi regime emergency powers. After Hindenburg died the following year, Hitler combined the presidency with his office as chancellor before proceeding to declare himself Führer und Reichskanzler des Deutschen Volkes, leader and Reich Chancellor of the German people, and transformed Germany into a totalitarian state. Okay, so just wanted to refresh on... Um, uh, my biographical dictionary of the Third Reich. The clue lay in the petty bourgeoisie, which, during a period of economic depression, had become a huge element of discontent seeking a political vehicle for its grievances. Because of its threatened economic condition, it leaned towards radical formulas, whether from the left or the right. Thus, the struggle which developed between communism and fascism for the, quote, soul, end quote, of the petty bourgeoisie and the workers, and which, for reasons Trotsky had elucidated in his criticism of communist tactics, was resolved in favor of fascism. Without the support of the petty bourgeoisie, the workers, and thus the communist movement, were unable to make a breakthrough, but the big bourgeoisie as well was unable to assert its hegemony without the petty bourgeoisie. And as for the petty bourgeoisie itself now making up the main support of the fascist movement, it could not become a dominant political force on its own since it lacked real economic power. In this situation of a polarization of the two, quote, exploited, end quote, classes, in separate and radical political movements, neither of which was strong enough to seize power, yet both of which were large enough to prevent others from exercising power effectively, Disorder, violence, virtual anarchy became normal, everyday phenomenon. 
quote, street politics, end quote, took over from, the institu from institutional politics. This was obviously inimical to the interests of the big bourgeoisie. And the big bourgeoisie, though separated by an abyss from the petty bourgeoisie and reluctant to share power with the petty bourgeoisie, finally saw the big bourgeoisie's only salvation lay in alliance with the petty bourgeoisie. Thus did the big bourgeoisie, finance capital, join forces with fascism to produce the Nazi government of 1933. There was no doubt in Trotsky's mind that the Nazi government scrupulously served the interest of big capitalism. Although political power became monopolized in the hands of Hitler, the big bourgeoisie retained the big bourgeoisie's economic power base. It is in this sense, therefore, that fascism became a new variant of capitalist government, albeit a form of capitalist government appearing during the decline or degeneration of capitalism. That it almost immediately took on such an extreme form of brutality and depression must partly, at least in Trotsky's view, be attributed to the main goal it set itself, the virtual liquidation of the proletariat as a social force. From this followed all the main elements of totalitarianism, the ideological negation of class divisions, and the attempts to atomize society in one ubiquitous collective, a nationalist and racist ideology to provide the semblance of unity and homogeneity, economic, economic and cultural regimentation, and state power personified in the figure of the Fuhrer. Because natural natural class divisions in German society were stronger than this new ideology could cope with, the Nazi government retained and refined the characteristic features of a Bonapartist regime, relying on the police and special organs of suppression. But it was more than just a form of Bonapartism, and thus more stable and more dangerous, because it represented the social and political union of both the higher and the lower bourgeoisie. Trotsky's analysis of German fascism for all the sweep and power of its generalization suffered from an exaggerated imposition of the Marxist theoretical framework. As a result, it overemphasized the subsequent, if not original, role of big capital and neglected the extent to which Hitler was ultimately able to exercise power almost independently of particular economic interests by creating autonomous political organs, the party, the secret police, and the bureaucracy. Footnote. For an example of a work which argues the thesis that after 1936, economics in Germany became subordinated to the political power structure, see David Schoenbaum, Hitler's Social Revolution, published in London in 1966, would see also a similar argument in T.W. Mason, quote, the Primacy of Politics, Politics and Economics in National Socialist Germany in S.J. Wolf, The Nature of Fascism. I think T.W. Mason was a Marxist of some kind, but it says David Schoenbaum was an, is an Amer born in 1935, is an American historian writing on a wide range of subjects, including German political history in the periods of World War II, Nazism, the 1960s, and contemporary politics, European and global cultural history, and U.S. diplomatic history. And it says... And it seems, says that Timothy Mason, T. W. Timothy Wright Mason, who lived from 1940 to 1990, was an English Marxist historian of Nazi Germany. T. W. Mason was one of the founders of the History Workshop Journal and specialized in the social history of the Third Reich. Mason argued for the, quote, primacy of politics, uh, end quote, I that the Nazi government was, quote, increasingly independent of the influence of the German economic ruling classes, end quote, and believe the Second World War had been triggered by an economic crisis inside Germany. Back to the text. In 
Yet Trotsky was not entirely blind to this evolution of Nazi power. Although he persisted in the view that economic interest remained supreme, it was just this Bonapartist tendency of Nazism which seemed to Trotsky to assure its eventual downfall. For the more politics became severed from economics and society, and the more terror replaced institutional government, the more did this signify that the regime was becoming isolated and unable to cope with social problems and divisions. The need to resort with ever-growing regularity to force, the failure to cure society's ills were not accidental. They grew, according to Trotsky, out of the fact that fascism, although it was meant to conceal the decline of capitalism, through its ideology and policies exposed all the underlying elements of capitalism's decay and degeneration. Quote, Fascism has opened up the depths of society for politics. Today, not only in peasant homes, but also in city skyscrapers, there lives alongside the 20th century, the 10th or the 13th. A hundred million people use electricity and still believe in the magic power of signs and exorcisms. The Pope of Rome broadcasts over the radio about the miraculous transformation of water into wine. Movie stars go to mediums. Aviators who pilot miraculous mechanisms created by man's genius wear amulets on their sweaters. What inexhaustible reserves they possess of darkness, ignorance, and savagery. Despair has raised them to their feet. Fascism has given them a banner. Everything that should have been eliminated from the national organism in the form of cultural excrement in the course of the normal development of society has now, become, has now come gushing out from the throat. Capitalist society is puking up the undigested barbarism, such as the physiology of national socialism. End quote, Trotsky. Um, see Trotsky's article, Nationalism and Economic Life in Foreign Affairs, April 1934. Just curious. Um, foreign Affairs is an American magazine of international relations and U.S. foreign policy published by the Council on Foreign Relations, a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization and think tank specializing in U.S. foreign policy and international affairs. Founded in September 1922, the print magazine is currently published every two months, while the website publishes articles daily and anthologies every other month. Foreign Affairs is considered one of America's most influential foreign policy magazines. Over its long history, it has published articles. Excuse me, it has published a number of seminal articles, including George Kennan's X article published in 1947 and Samuel P. Huntington's The Clash of Civilizations published in 1993. Leading academics, public officials, and members of the policy community regularly contribute to the magazine. Recent foreign affairs authors include Robert O. Keohain, Hillary Clinton, Donald H. Rumsfeld, Ashton Carter, Colin L. Powell, Francis Fukuyama, David Petraeus, Zbigniew Brzezinski, John J. Mearsheimer, Stanley McChrystal, Christopher R. Hill, and Joseph Nye. Interesting. China. Footnote. The most important of Trotsky's writings on China are the following. The draft program of the communist internationalism, a criticism of fundamentals, which is located in the third international after Lenin, um, chapter three, uh, summary and perspectives of the Chinese revolution, 
pages 167 to 230, Problems of the Chinese Revolution, published in 1969. This work, cons work consists of various pieces written between 1927 and 1931. Each originally appeared independently in Russia, but the compilation as a whole was issued in English for convenience. Therefore, all references are to the English compilation, which first appeared in 1932, and of which the above edition is the latest. Um, a piece called, uh, a piece from, uh, a piece in Russian, Revolutia, Revolutia i Voina v Kitai in uh, the Opposition Bulletin of December 1938, was, republic was published in English as the preface to Harold Isaac's The Tragedy of the Chinese Revolution, published in London in 1938. References to some of Trotsky's writings on China are given in footnotes which follow. Among Trotsky's writings on the East are two articles on India, these concentrate on the issue of imperialism, but their interpretation of the process of an Indian revolution is very similar to that made by Trotsky of the Chinese case, which will be discussed here. Okay, end footnote. In the midst of one of his many polemics against Stalin's policies toward a Chinese revolution, Trotsky, dissecting the reasons for the communist debacle in China during the 1925 to 27 period, felt obliged to point out that all his warnings and prophecies had been only too tragically vindicated. Quote, the strength of Marxism, end quote, Trotsky noted in this context, quote, lies in its ability to foretell, end quote. Yet nothing so reveals the limits of Marxist prophecy as the Chinese experience. And nothing so conspicuously bears the limits of Trotsky's own prophetic powers as the eventual evolution of the Chinese Communist movement. Though Trotsky took special pains to acquaint himself with conditions in China, Trotsky's grasp of Chinese reality proved to be almost totally misconstrued. In part, this grew out of the difficulties inherent in attempting to assimilate the peculiarities of Chinese politics and society into a Marxist framework. Mm -hmm. Largely, however, Second. largely, however, it was a product of Trotsky's assumption that the Russian experience of 1917 could be generalized for the East, and that this experience had established once and for all the logical link between backwardness and socialism. This is not to say that he was less prescient about Chinese affairs than Stalin. On the contrary, with regard to the fiasco of 1927, he had every right to claim that it had proven the correctness of the criticism of Soviet and Comintern policy in China. This policy had been based on the primary objective of creating as wide a front as possible in China against Western powers and Japan. Thus the Comintern had urged the Chinese Communist Party to enter the nationalist movement, the Kuomintang. This, is, this the party did in 1923. Thus also, in subsequent years, whenever conflicts arose between the communists and the nationalists, the Comintern sought to preserve the alliance even if in a way disadvantageous to the communists. The consequence of this policy eventually was the strengthening of the Kuomintang and the undermining of the communists. In 1927, it culminated in clashes in Shanghai and Canton, which left the communists in virtual disarray with their urban base entirely destroyed. Footnote. On the history, both political and ideological, of the Chinese communist movement during the period discussed, see in particular Conrad Brandt, Stalin's Failure in China, published in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1958. Isaacs, see Isaacs, in the third edition of this work, published in 1961, Isaacs revised considerably his earlier, quote, Trotskyist, end quote, viewpoint. Benjamin Schwartz, Chinese Communism and the Rise of Mao, published in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1951. End footnote.
The Comintern's policy toward the communists in China, though motivated, motivated primarily by immediate political considerations, was provided by Stalin from the outset with doctrinal arguments. These were briefly as follows. The Comintern was a revolutionary progressive force because the Gomindong was anti-imperialist. Although it was nationalist and bourgeois in character, this suited the particular revolutionary stage at which China found herself. What was needed in China was in fact a bourgeois democratic revolution, one which would assert the independence of China, carry out large-scale agrarian and other economic reforms, and thus, eventually, prepare the ground for a subsequent socialist revolution. In the meantime, the communist movement, too weak to pursue power on its own, had to join forces with the nationalists in order to create a powerful, quote, block of four classes, end quote. The national bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie, the peasants and workers against feudal landlords and foreign, foreign imperialists. In this way, the interests of the ultimate socialist revolution would best be served. Footnote. For Stalin's political and doctrinal views on China, see his Ob Oppositsi, Moscow, 1928. And footnote. It was only natural that Trotsky should brand this doctrine a form of, quote, Menshevism, end quote. The affinity was quite striking, and he made the most of it in his attacks on Stalin. Trotsky ridiculed firstly the notion that the Gomendong represented a force which was fundamentally hostile either to landed interest or to foreign capital. Trotsky claimed that although purporting to be a movement for social reform, the Gomendong had allied itself to old feudal elements which, in turn, were deeply interconnected with urban capital. Foreign-inspired capitalism had already made significant inroads into the Chinese economy, and the Gomendong in an effort to protect these inroads was basically a, quote, lackey, end quote, of Western imperialism. Thus, the situation was substantially no different from what it had been in Russia before 1917. True, Russia had not been under foreign rule like China, but the dependence of the Tsar on foreign capital is in many ways tantamount to the same thing. The Russian bourgeoisie, like the Chinese, was not an independent force. It, too, tried to lay... It was too... It, too, was tied to landed interest in foreign capital, and so greatly feared peasant and worker discontent that it was prepared to compromise with the existing political and social structure. Under the circumstances, a bourgeois revolution in Russia had been impossible, and the period from February to October 1917 confirmed this conclusively. This, according to Trotsky, should have been enough to bury Menshevism forever, and set a new generation of, quote, Mensheviks, end quote, Stalin and his followers, was attempting to impose the, quote, mechanistic, end quote, theory of revolutionary, quote, stages, end quote, upon China. Here, too, it was bound to fail. Support for the bourgeois revolution, for the Gomindong, Gomindong, meant to affect support for the status quo. As in Russia, the only pol policy which could bring about real change was one which supported, worked towards the creation of an independent workers' party supported by the peasantry. Any other policy, based on collaboration with the bourgeoisie, would in the end betray the workers' and peasants' interests. Instead of bringing a socialist revolution closer, it would push it into the distant future, and this is, in fact, what, according to Trotsky, had happened in China in 1927. Footnote. This summary of Trotsky's critique of Stalin's policies is based on the writings mentioned in Note 40 above. See also the real situation in Russia and permanent inaya revolutionitsia. One footnote. In and footnote. In presenting this argument, Trotsky was, of course, advocating anew his theory of the permanent revolution. Admitting that there was certain important differences between China and Russia, the tradition of, quote, oriental despotism, end quote, the more remote impact of the West, the experience of foreign rule, the even greater preponderance of the peasant population, 
he was nevertheless convinced that the theory of the permanent revolution was as valid for China as it had been for Russia. This meant, as in Russia, that the immediate goal, an agrarian revolution, could not be realized in China outside the framework of a socialist revolution. The revolutionary developments would not follow preconceived stages, but would be, quote, combined, end quote, making possible a direct, quote, passing over, end quote, from democratic to socialist tasks. That the only social class capable of undertaking such revolutionary tasks was the proletariat, quote, leaning, end quote, on the support of the peasantry. That, however, the resulting workers' government would eventually lose the support of the peasantry and have to turn elsewhere for assistance, and that therefore this loss of support, combined with the limitations imposed by backwardness, would make it impossible for China to complete her socialist revolution on her own. Like Russia, China would have to turn to the international arena and become dependent on the world revolution. Thus all the central elements of the theory of permanent revolution, originally derived from the case of Russia, appeared to Trotsky to be applicable to the Chinese case as well. Footnote. For his discussion of the Chinese case in terms of the theory of, revo of the permanent revolution, see in particular problems of the Chinese revolution. In footnote. That they were not applied in China, either in theory or in practice, was, in Trotsky's view, due entirely to the leadership in the Soviet Union the common turn, and to the doctrine of, quote, socialism in one country, end quote. The events of 1927, he therefore believed, confirmed the theory of the permanent revolution in a new way, quote, this time not in the form of a victory, but of a catastrophe, end quote. Stalin's policies in China had indeed proven to be disastrous for the common sort of the communist movement there. Did it follow, however, that had Trotsky's alternative been adopted, the result would have been a communist success? In fairness to Trotsky, it should be noted that he nowhere claimed that a communist revolution in China was necessarily imminent in the 1920s, but only that it was the process of becoming imminent from the point of view of, quote, objective, end quote, conditions, that it was therefore essential in the meantime to create a, quote, Bolshevik-Leninist, end quote, party, equipped with the right theoretical outlook. Thus, to judge the validity of the position of Trotsky advocated, as against the validity of his criticism of Stalin, one need look at it not so much in the context of the 1920s as in the light of that subsequent development of the Chinese Communist Movement, which ultimately, and nearly a decade after Trotsky's death, did lead to success. In a general way, it may be said that 1949 confirmed one central aspect of the theory of permanent revolution, namely that in a backward society, a socialist revolution can break out before a bourgeois revolution or at least before a bourgeois revolution has been completed. Although China may have had what amounted to a bourgeois revolution in a political sense as long ago as 1911, Socially and economically, nothing had happened in the intervening period could be defined as a culmination of what Marxism had described as Western capitalist development. Thus, 1949 in China, like 1917 in Russia, was from a, quote, orthodox, end quote, Marxist point of view, premature, and appeared to confirm what Trotsky had always claimed, that only a socialist and not a bourgeois regime could undertake the solution to problems of backwardness in the 20th century. I um, just want to read a little bit about the 1911 revolution in China. The 1911 revolution, also known as the Xinhai Revolution, or the Xinhai Revolution spelled differently, ended China's last imperial dynasty, the Qing Dynasty. 
and led to the establishment of the Republic of China. The revolution was the culmination of a decade of agitation, revolts, and uprisings. Its success marked the collapse of the Chinese monarchy. The end of 2,132 years of imperial rule in China and 276 years of the Qing dynasty in the beginning of China's early republican era. The Qing dynasty had struggled for a long time to reform the government and resist foreign aggression, but the program of reforms after 1900 was opposed by conservatives in the Qing court as too radical and by reformers as too slow. Several factions, including underground anti-Qing groups, revolutionaries in exile, reformers who wanted to save the monarchy by modernizing the monarchy, and activists across the country debated how or whether to overthrow the Qing dynasty. The flashpoint came on the 10th of October 1911, when the Wu Chang uprising, an armed rebellion among members of the new army, excuse me, with the Wu Chang uprising, an armed rebellion among members of the new army. Similar revolts then broke out spontaneously around the country, and revolutionaries in all provinces of the country renounced the Qing dynasty. On the 1st of November 1911, the Qing court appointed Yuan Shikai, leader of the powerful Beiyang army, as prime minister, and he began negotiations with the revolutionaries. In Nanjing, revolutionary forces created a provisional coalition government. On the 1st of January 1912, the National Assembly declared the establishment of the Republic of China with Sun Yat-sen, leader of the Tang Menghui United League, as president of the Republic. A brief civil war between the North and South ended in compromise. Sun would resign in favor of Yuan Shikai, who would become president of the new national government, if Yuan could secure the abdication of the Qing Emperor. The Edict of Abdication of the Six-Year-Old Xuantong Emperor was promulgated on the 12th of February 1912. Yuan was sworn in as president on the 10th of March 1912. In December 1915, Yuan restored the monarchy and proclaimed himself as the Hongxian Empire, Emperor. But the move was met with strong opposition from the population and the army, leading to his abdication in March 1916 and the reinstatement of the Republic. Yuan's failure to consolidate a legitimate central government before his death in June 1916 led to decades of political division and warlordism, including an attempt at imperial restoration of the Qing dynasty. The, resolution, the revolution is named the Xin Hai because it's a, occurred in 1911, the year of the Xin Hai, stem branch in the sexagenary cycle of the traditional Chinese calendar. The Republic of China on the island of Taiwan and the People's Republic of China in mainland China both consider themselves the legitimate successors to the 1911 revolution and honor the ideals of revolution, including nationalism, republicanism, modernization of China, and national unity. On the tenth of the tenth of October is the National Day of the Republic of China, on Taiwan, and the anniversary of the nineteen eleven revolution in the People's Republic of China. Back to the text. But beyond this general and though important proposition, the post-1927 development of the Chinese Communist movement not only does not bear out other important aspects of the theory of permanent revolution, but sets certain limits to the theory's universal validity for backward countries. Two elements in particular came to, be, came to distinguish the Communist movement in China, its almost exclusively peasant basis and its force as a focus for nationalist sentiments. Footnote. On the role played by nationalism in the development of Chinese communism, see Chalmers Johnson, Peasant Nationalism and Communist Power, Stanford, 1962. End footnote. Both these elements were either ignored or de deprecated in Trotsky's prognosis for China. Trotsky did not, it is true, discount or underestimate the importance of peasant support. In fact, as in his analysis of Russia, Trotsky was prepared to admit that without initial peasant support, a communist revolution was inconceivable. But throughout his writings on China, as indeed in all his writings where the subject of the peasantry arose, he categorically rejected the possibility of a revolution under peasant leadership or based primarily on the countryside. Again and again, Trotsky stressed the limitations of the peasantry. 
the peasantry's backwardness, bar narrowness of vision, lack of political experience and of ideological consciousness, and its economic weakness. Even in China, he believed town towered over village, and the road to power lay through the urban centers. Trotsky was convinced that the Chinese communist movement could triumph only as a workers' movement. The alliance with the peasantry had therefore to be an unequal one, with the proletariat clearly at the helm. Thus in the Chinese context as well, Trotsky spoke of a, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote, and not of the proletariat and peasantry. Footnote. For typical examples of his views on Chinese peasants and workers and on the, quote, dictatorship of the proletariat, end quote, see Draft Program of the Communist International, A Criticism of Fundamentals, and Problems of China, the Chinese Revolution. And footnote. Even towards the end of the 1930s, Trotsky wrote of the prospects of greater industrialization in China, which would reinforce the political supremacy of the working class. It, was, it is no wonder, therefore, that Trotsky looked askance at the evolution of Chinese communism as a rural movement, with its base of power in the countryside and not in the cities. And he denounced as, quote, adventurism, end quote, the guerrilla warfare which it practiced. Trotsky's attitude toward Chinese communism as a nationalist movement was similarly uneasy and skeptical. On the one hand, Trotsky appreciated the importance to be attached to anti-colonialism, the political value which accrued to those who could mobilize national support against foreign powers. But on the other hand, Trotsky stressed the national liberation should be understood only as a form of social liberation that the struggle against external rule is in essence a struggle against one and the same enemy, capitalism and the bourgeoisie, and was therefore a class struggle. Trotsky appeared to have little appreciation for the sense of na nationhood which existed in China, and, in any case, his anti-nationalist attitudes would not allow him to gauge objectively the significance of the communist nationalism emerging in Asia generally. It should not be difficult to guess what Trotsky's reaction to the Chinese Revolution of 1949 would have been had he lived to witness it, assuming his views remained consistent with his lifetime convictions. He would have welcomed the revolution insofar as it put an end to Gomindong rule, but Trotsky would almost certainly have had serious reservations about its socialist character. It quite clearly negated both the direct link with which he claimed existed between a socialist revolution and the proletariat, and the subsidiary revolutionary role which he always attributed to the peasantry. Trotsky would surely have argued that under the circumstances, the possibilities of socialism in China were even more limited than in Russia. Yet the fact remains that in terms of ideology, party leadership and goals, the Chinese revolution was no less, quote, socialist, end quote, than the Russian. If there was a difference in its class basis and in the manner of its coming to power, this may suggest that the link between a backward society and a socialist movement was in the last resort dependent no less on peasants than on workers and, perhaps above all, on party organization. Had Trotsky, after all, underestimated the peasantry as a revolutionary force? And in spite of his 1917 conversion to Lenin's conception of the revolutionary party, had Trotsky perhaps still not grasped? in a, quote, Leninist, end quote, way, the importance of this instrument of revolution? In both the Russian and Chinese cases, it would seem, the crucial factors were organization, leadership, strategy, and tactics, and, despite the undoubtedly more direct mass element in the Chinese case, total control by a determined elite of professional revolutionaries. Footnote. On the role of organization and leadership in Chinese communism, see Franz Sherman, Ideology and Organization in Communist China. And footnote. As we have seen, Trotsky after 1917 had come to appreciate the dependence of 20th century Marxism on, quote, Leninism, end quote not only in Russia, but in Europe as well. Footnote. The extent to which Trotsky made the European Revolution dependent on, quote, Leninism may be gauged from the following, written in 1928. 
in the German Re quote in the German Revolution of 1918, in the Hungarian Revolution of 1919, in the September movement of the Italian proletariat in 1920, in the English general strike of 1926, in the Vienna uprising of 1927, and in the Chinese Revolution of 1925 to 27. Everywhere, one in the same political contradictions of the entire past decade, even if at different stages and in different forms, was manifested. In an objectively right revolutionary situation, right not only with regard to its social bases, but not infrequently also with regard to the mood of, for struggle of the masses, the subjective factor, that is, a revolutionary mass party, was lacking, or else this party lacked a far-sighted and intrepid leadership, end quote, from the draft program. This was followed by a sentence which suggested that Trotsky was not unaware of the more complicated reasons for the failures of revolution in Europe. Quote, of course, end quote, Trotsky wrote, quote, the weaknesses of the communist parties and their leadership did not fall from the sky, but are rather a product of the entire past of Europe, end quote. See also Trotsky's uh, Yeroki Oktyabria, Berlin, 1925, and something else in Russian. Whereas ex post facto rationalization of the role of the Bolsheviks in the success of the Russian Revolution and the lessons to be learned from this. End footnote. But Trotsky continued to insist on relating, quote, Leninism, end quote, to traditional Marxist assumptions about classes and revolution more so than it was apparently essential in practice to thus relate it. This is not to say that, quote, Leninism, end quote, or its Chinese offshoot, quote, Maoism, end quote, was merely a political artifice functioning in a social vacuum. On the contrary, that it achieved successes in backward societies could be seen as a reflection, in fact, of Trotsky's own thesis about the particular vulnerability of such societies to radical socialist movements. But it did mean that, quote, Leninism's, end quote, scope for maneuver was much wider and more autonomous than Trotsky had assumed, that given the fundamental revolutionary conditions existing in backward countries, revolution itself became a function of political skills and organization, not class development. To put it another way, the agent of change had come to be one particular party, but not any one particular class. That's a very good, that's an interesting sentence. To put it another way, the agent of change had come to be one particular party, not any one particular class. Footnote. Trotsky always refused to acknowledge this and assumed that Lenin too would have proposed building a communist movement based almost exclusively on the peasantry. The point, however, is not what Lenin would have thought, even if Trotsky's assumption was right, which is far from certain, but what, quote, Leninism, end quote, came to mean to others, like Mao, who claimed to be guided by Leninism. Ironically, it was Stalin, perhaps, who in the end grasped more fully than Trotsky the realities of revolutionary power and, in spite of his many mistakes, was prepared to make greater allowances for the peculiarities of the Chinese situation. In this connection, see the introduction by Benjamin Schwartz to the third American reprint of Trotsky's Problems of the Chinese Revolution, published in New York, 1966. End footnote. Finally, the scope for ideological innovation also was wider than Trotsky had assumed. Nationalism, too, could be a vehicle for the socialist revolution.